Puerto Rico, how to set up and play. So first thing you'll do is lay out all the different components. You've got victory point chips, plantation tiles, colonists. This is the colonist ship. This is the buildings board with all the buildings laid out. This is the trading house. These are the cargo ships for shipping goods. You've got your supply or your, yeah, of goods, corn, indigo, sugar, tobacco, coffee, and doubloons. Every player will have a player board uh, with an island for the plantation tiles and the city for the buildings, as well as your windrows or San Juan uh, to store goods and doubloons. These are the roll cards or tiles that are the heart of the game. First thing you'll do is set up all the different buildings. Uh, this is set up for the base game. So each building has a specified area to go. If you're playing with the expansion, uh, you can randomly set it up or do a draft uh, with, the, with the different players or just choose which buildings you want to use. Uh, typically, you'll want to follow this sequence based on the cost of the building. One, two, two, three. That's the cost of the buildings in the first column. Probably the most important thing about setup is it will vary based on the number of players in the game. So based on the players, you'll have an available number of victory point tokens that you'll make available. So in a two-player game like this is, I've set that up with 65 um, victory point, a total of 65 points. In a five-player game, we will use all 122 victory points that are included in the game. Next, you'll decide how many prospector rolls are used in the game based on the players. So on a two-player game, we're just using one prospector roll. If it was a three-player game, we wouldn't use any, but if it was a five-player game, we'd actually use two prospector rolls. Next, it's the number of colonists on the ship. Two, that's always based on the number of players in the game. Now, the number of colonists that are actually in the supply. So, 40 in a two-player game. You'll decide how, uh, how many cargo ships are going to be used. So in this example, we're using the four and the six cargo ship based on the number of uh, holes they have available for goods. The number of face-up plantations. It's always one more than the number of players. So on a two-player game, it would be three. Starting doubloons, three each for each player. And the starting plantations. So you'll randomly decide who's going to be the start player. That'll be the governor. Uh, in this game, they would get an indigo. And the second player would get a corn. Now, there is a variation that players that get the starting corn plantation would start with one less doubloon than normal. So I'm using that today. And that's because corn tends to be more powerful because it doesn't require a production building during the craftsman phase. So that's the typical things you would set up in the game. There was a couple extra things for a two-player game before you would actually do any of this. You would remove three each of the plantations and the quarries. So normally there's eight of these. You'd take three of them out and use five. Uh, you'd remove two of each of the goods. Just put them back in the box. You'd only use two of the production buildings, so every player in a two-player game could get a production building. And you'd only use one each of the beige buildings. So there's only one each for each of these uh, for the players. Puerto Rico is played in rounds. Every round, the governor will start, and play will always proceed clockwise from the governor. Uh, what happens is the governor will choose an available role that hasn't been selected that round. And when the role is selected, 
two things will happen. Um, everybody will get an action, starting with the governor and then proceeding clockwise. And the, the person that actually selected the role will actually get a privilege based on the role. So the round starts with the governor. The governor would select a role, take the privilege, everyone else gets to do the action, and then going clockwise, the next player to the governor's left, they would select a role, get the privilege, everyone would perform the action. The round would end once every player has had a chance to select uh, one of the roles and you know take the privilege for that role, and then in the Let's say these were selected, let's say it was a four player game, and these were the four roles selected. Any unselected roles would get a doubloon placed on them at the end of the round, and that way in subsequent rounds, if you took that role, you'd obviously get the normal privilege in addition to any doubloons sitting on the role. Now, it, the variant for a two player game is the round doesn't end until each of the two players have selected three rolls, and that'll end the round, and the last remaining roll would receive the doubloon placed on it. Once the round is over, the player with the governor tile would pass this to their left, and now that player would be the governor, and basically, the, obviously, the governor starts the round, so they're the first one to select the roll, and then you'd complete the round like that until the game ends. So let's cover each of the rolls. Uh, the settler roll. So starting with the player that selects the roll, going clockwise, each player will take a face-up plantation. They may take a face-up plantation, and when they take it, they've got to immediately place it onto their island, into an empty spot. If there are no empty spots on your island, you cannot take a plantation tile. If you are the one that actually took the settler roll, your privilege is you can take a quarry instead of a plantation and place it on your island. At the end of the settler phase, once everyone's made their decision whether to take a tile, uh, you'll discard any remaining face-up tiles and you'll immediately draw new tiles randomly based on the number of players. It's always one more than the number of players. So in a two-player game, we would draw three new tiles. If this ever depleted, you could reshuffle any discarded tiles and add them back to here. Next is the mayor roll. When the mayor roll is selected, everyone gets to uh, get new colonists from the colonist ship. The privilege for being the one that selects the mayor roll is you get one additional colonist directly from the supply. So that would be taken from the supply. Let's say this player selected the mayor role. Now, starting with the person that selected the role and going clockwise, you'll take colonists off the ship. So the player that selected the mayor role would get that one, and the second player would get this one. The number of colonists will change throughout the game that are actually on the ship. So let's say it's later in the game and there were actually three colonists on the ship. The player that selected the mayor roll would take their privilege, take one from the supply. They would take the first one. This player would take this one, and then they would get this one. So you keep going clockwise from the person that selected the roll until you've taken all the mayors, or I'm sorry, all the colonists. Another thing in the mayor phase is that any colonists that have been on your windrows, or maybe they were on plantations or buildings, can now be rearranged. So you can take a colonist off and make decisions on where to place them. You, if you have empty circles, you have to place the colonists. If all the circles are filled on plantations or buildings, any additional colonists can wait here in what's called San Juan. At the end of the mayor phase, you will refill the colonist ship based on the number of empty spots on all the players' buildings. 
So you're not going to look at the island tiles, you're going to look at the building tiles. And here in this example, two empty spots, and this player has one empty spot, so we would add three colonists uh, to the colonist ship. Now the minimum number of colonists is always based on the number of players. So let's say let's say everyone had their buildings occupied, so there were no empty spots, so we would simply just add two colonists based on the number of players to the colonist ship. If at the end of the mayor phase we did not have enough colonists in the supply to refill the number of spaces we needed, that triggers the end of the game. So we will complete that round and then final scoring would take place after that. So that's one of the end game triggers if we're unable to fill the colonists we need to. Uh, the game will end at the end of the current round. In the builder phase, every player will get the chance or the option to buy a building if they'd like to and if they can afford it. Um, you'll start, obviously, from the person that selected the role. We'll get the option first. Their privilege is that they get a one doubloon discount on the cost of the building. The building costs are listed right here in this circle. This indicates the number of victory points this building will be worth at the end of the game. So a small indigo plant costs one doubloon to build, and you can see the prices go up as you get over here. The large buildings cost 10 to build. The columns are important because the column that the building is in indicates how much of a discount you can apply from your quarries. So you remember a quarry can be gotten in the settler phase as the privilege for the settler and a quarry provides a one discount, a minus one doubloon discount on the price of a building. Now keep in mind all buildings have to be occupied by a colonist in order to activate the power. So if I had an empty quarry on my island, that would do nothing for me. I would have to have had it manned by a colonist in order to get this discount. So I, since I have one manned quarry, I get an additional minus one discount for any building purchased in this row. You can see you can apply up to a four quarry discount for buildings in this column. So getting more than four quarries generally does not help you in terms of getting additional discounts. Now let's say I had three manned quarries, but I was buying a building from this column. I don't get a three discount. I can only apply a maximum of a one quarry discount to anything purchased here. Two in this column, three in this column, and four in this column. So play will proceed clockwise from the person that selected the builder role. Each player gets the option to buy one building during a builder phase. You can pass. Also, uh, any player can only ever have one of each type of building. So you could never have two large sugar mills or two of these beige buildings. You can only ever have one of each type. Also, the lowest price you'll ever pay is zero. So you can get buildings for free. If, let's say, you took the builder privilege and you got your minus one discount, you'd get this small indigo plant for free. Let's say you also had a man quarry. It doesn't go into the negative, so the, the floor is always zero or free for a building. One thing to keep in mind is when you buy the building and place it in your city, uh, you can never rearrange this. So be very strategic in terms of where you place your buildings, making sure you leave room later in the game for some of these buildings that take two of the tiles. Also, when you place the building, you're not allowed to rearrange any of your colonists. That only happens during the mayor phase. It gives you the ability to rearrange and change your assignments on the colonists. So this will stay inactive until you're able to, in a next, in the subsequent mayor phase, get a colonist to activate that building. In the craftsman phase, all players will produce based on their manned plantations and production buildings. 
The privilege is you'd actually get an additional good uh, from the supply if you selected the role based on one of the goods you produced. So in order to produce, for example, sugar, I would have needed a sugar plantation manned and a production building manned also, and this would produce one sugar, I'm sorry, one indigo. Let's do another example. Let's say I have that, and I did not have my plantation manned, this will not produce anything. So you need both the plantation and the production building manned. That goes for indigo, sugar, tobacco, and coffee. Corn is the only one where it only requires a manned plantation tile. There are no production buildings for corn, so this would produce one corn. It's also important to realize that even if I had two on the production buildings, I still only have one man plantation. This would just produce one sugar. I would need another sugar tile to take advantage of both these uh, colonists that are manned in the production building. So turn order is very important for the craftsman phase. Keep in mind, the player that selects this, they will produce first. So because these goods could be in limited supply. So if there was only one corn left in the supply and they produced first, they would produce their corn. The next player to go, even if they had a manned corn plantation, if there are none in the supply, they go without. So in clockwise order, starting with the player that selected the role, they do all their production. Then the next player does all their production, assuming there are goods left to produce. The privilege for the craftsman doesn't happen until the end of the phase. So once all players have produced, uh, the craftsman can decide to take an additional good based on one of the ones they produced, assuming it's still available in the supply. The trader role gives all the players uh, the option to sell one of their goods to the trading house for the listed value so corn has a base value of zero. You wouldn't get any doubloons for that. There are buildings that help you improve that. Indigo one, sugar two, tobacco three, and coffee four. The privilege for the trader roll is when they sell their good. If, if they sell their good, they'd get an additional doubloon from the bank. So a couple rules for how the trading house works. There can ever only be one of each good in the trading house. So if someone has sold indigo to the trading house, when it gets around to your turn, you cannot sell indigo because the demand has already been met. Also, there are only four spots in the trading house. So if it gets to your turn and all four spots are filled, you will not be able to sell a good at the trading house. So each player in clockwise order, starting with the person that selects the role, gets the option to sell one good to the trading house, assuming it's not already there, and there's an available spot. At the end of the trader phase, if the trading house is full, all goods get cleared off, um, and returned to the supply, making them available for a future round. A strategic point, you may decide to sell corn, even though it's worth zero dollars, just to maybe block somebody else from selling it, or to fill it up, or maybe you've got the small market building that we'll talk about that actually gives you a doubloon in addition and you'd get one. So some considerations there. Next is the captain phase. Everyone will get the chance to deliver goods uh, for victory points in clockwise order starting with the captain. They have to deliver, they must deliver one type of good uh, to a cargo ship and you'll score victory points for each barrel you deliver. So if I deliver the two, let's say I've produced, and I have two indigos, I've gotta deliver all of one type. If there's room, I would get two victory points for that. The privilege for the captain is on the first delivery, they would get an extra victory point. 
So during the captain phase, you must load as many as possible, but you get to choose the type. So let's say in this example, the first player to load loaded two indigo. They could have chosen this boat since it was empty. Once a boat has been designated, it can only store that type of good. So this has been now designated as an indigo boat. So only indigos can be placed on this boat. If that was the case, you could do that. And you can never have multiple boats with the same type of good. There can only be one indigo boat in the harbor. That's the one that's going to sail back to Spain. So let's say this player decided to do that, going clockwise. The next player has a choice to make. They've got three indigo, so they have to ship as many as possible. So they can't go here because this is the indigo boat. So they could ship two indigo and get two victory points, and this would be retained until the end of the captain phase. Or they could decide, well, I'm going to ship the sugar and corn and put it there and then designate this boat for that good. Play will keep going clockwise until there are no more deliveries possible. So if that player decides to make that a corn boat, it would go back to this player. They have no more goods to deliver. Now it goes back to this player. Well, now they can take the two. So they get one victory point here and two victory points here. Again, this player has nothing to deliver. And now this player can't deliver because there's no available spot for sugar and the indigo boat is full. So that would be the end of the phase uh, for shipping goods. The victory points you get come from the supply and they are turned face down to keep them hidden until the end of the game. And now a couple things happen at the end of the captain phase. If there are any full ships, they will sail off. So you'll take all the goods, return them to the supply. And now this cargo ship is available in a future round to be designated for the same type of good or a different type of good based on who places there first. Also, any goods that were not able to get shipped, remember you're forced to ship if you can, any goods that were not able to get shipped will either have to be stored or they will spoil. Every player is allowed to store one barrel for free on their windrows and all other barrels would have to be discarded unless you have a building like a warehouse that allows you to store. It is your choice which good you want to store. All discarded, build, all discarded goods go directly back to the supply. If at the end of the captain phase, the last victory point chip is taken, that's another end game trigger. So at the end of the current round, uh, the game will end if the last victory point was taken. Uh, keep in mind, if one player takes the last victory point token, it triggers you know the end game at the end of the round, but subsequent players, if they're still able to ship and earn victory points, you would just record those victory points on paper. So you still get the victory points uh, from shipping, you just won't have the chips since the last one was taken, so just record that on paper. The prospector is the last roll. It offers no action to any of the players. Only the player that selects the prospector gets the privilege of taking one doubloon from the bank. So let's talk about the end of the game. So you'll remember the game can end in one of three ways. If you're unable to fill the number of colonists required on the colonist ship, if the last victory point chip is taken, or if a player builds onto their final spot in their city, that will trigger uh, the end of the game when the round is completed. And remember, the round isn't completed until the governor tile changes hands. So even if maybe the governor triggered the end of the game, every subsequent player going clockwise will still get their chance to select any remaining rolls until we get back, and that is the end of the round, and then we'll do final scoring. So all players will add up uh, three things. First, you'll reveal all your victory points, and you'll add up your victory points from your chits 
and if any were, were, were recorded on paper. Every player will get victory points for all their buildings on their player board. That's the red number in the upper right. It does not matter if they were manned or not at the end of the game. So this player would earn one, two, three, seven points at the end of the game for their buildings. And then finally, if they've earned any bonuses that come from the large buildings. So for example, the city hall, you get victory points for each of these beige buildings on your board. The large buildings only give their bonus if they are manned. So if this building wasn't manned, you would get the four points, but you would not trigger the end game bonus unless it was manned. If there's a tie for most victory points at the end of the game, the tiebreaker is whoever has the most combined doubloons and goods at the end of the game. So this player would have five, but it's only a tiebreaker. Other than a tiebreaker, extra goods and extra money are not worth anything at the end of the game. All right, next let's go over every building in the game and the power it provides. So let's first cover the end game building, the big buildings, the large buildings that give you victory points at the end of the game. First, the fortress. Remember, these need to be occupied to get the bonus. This would give you one victory point for every three colonists you have anywhere on your player board, even if they're in San Juan. The Customs House gives you one victory point for every four victory point chips you've accumulated through shipping. Um, now, remember, if chips run out at the end of the game and some of the victory points get written down on paper, those also count. This is basically a victory point for every four victory points you got for shipping. The Guild Hall gives you one victory point for each small production building and two victory points for each large production building. So one point extra for each of the smalls and two points extras for each of the large buildings, whether they're occupied or not. The cloister gives you one, three, six, or 10 victory points for every one, two, three, four sets of three different plantations. So you've got three corn and three quarries that would get you three victory points. The residence will give you four, five, six, or seven victory points for nine, 10, 11, or 12 filled island spaces on your player board. The plantation tiles do not need to be manned by a colonist. Um, this just means that they've been filled on your island. And then finally, the statue will give you no bonuses it just gives you a higher base value for the victory points for this building at the end of the game. It can't and doesn't need to be manned. All right, I've organized the other buildings by role as they provide powers to each of the roles, but the first one I want to talk about applies to all roles. It's the library. So if you've got your library occupied, it basically doubles the privilege whenever you select a role. Not the action, but the privilege. So if you selected the prospector roll, you'd get two doubloons, you'd get two victory points for your first shipment, you'd get one extra doubloon when you trade. If you produce, you would get two goods, they could be the same or two different ones. If you produce two different types, you would get a two doubloon discount with the builder, uh, you would get two colonists from the supply, and if you actually pick the settler, um, you may take a face-up tile after all others go. So you would take your normal uh, tile and then at the very end you could take a remaining face-up tile. So here are the buildings that benefit you during the settler phase. The first one is the construction hut. So normally you can only get a quarry if you take the settler as your privilege. Here, if you have it manned, uh, during the settler phase, instead of having to take an available face-up, you can actually take a quarry. The forest house allows you to get a different type of plantation on your island. So if you've got a manned forest house, during the settler phase, you would basically take any one of the available face-up tiles, turn it upside down, and place it on your island. That now counts as a forest plantation. Forests give you uh, discounts 
during the builder phase. For every two forests you have on your island, you get one doubloon discount when buying buildings. And there is no limit, like a quarry limit, so you could have as many pairs of forests as you want, each pair giving you one discount, and it'll stack with quarry discounts and other discounts during the builder phase. Also, a forest does not require a colonist. The hospice allows you during the settler phase to take a colonist from the supply and immediately place it on the main plantation tile you took. Um, now you're only able to get it on the main tile you took, so if you get uh, bonus tiles um, from other buildings, you don't get the free colonist. You only get this on the main one. So you would take it from the supply and place it onto the plantation tile you were taking right away. If there are none in the supply, you can take from the colonist ship. Also, if you, during the settler phase, you take a forest tile, you've decided to take a forest tile, you still get your free colonist, and you can just place it in San Juan for later use. The Hacienda allows you to get a free plantation during the settler phase. So on your turn, um, before you take your normal face-up tile, let's say those were the face-up tiles, you can take a face down tile randomly um, from the supply and you must place it on your board. That's optional, you don't have to take it, so if space is getting limited you may choose not to take a plantation tile and place it on your board. If you actually have a manned forest house also, after you look at it you can decide, you know what, I'm going to use this as a forest instead. And as we mentioned on the hospice, this only gives you the free colonist on your main tile. So if you had both these buildings manned and you got a free plantation, you would not get the extra colonist on it. So after you take your face down tile with the hacienda, then you could take your normal face up tile. And that's the one, for example, the hospice would benefit you on. In the mayor phase, there's one building that benefits this, and this is the guest house. So during the mayor phase, you can move two of your colonists, as you're rearranging your colonists, you can move them onto the guest house, up to two here. And then in later phases, at the beginning, the middle, or the end of a later phase, you can take a colonist from the guest house and immediately place them on any other building um, or plantation, and then immediately activate it. So it gives you some option later in the round to uh, make some decisions on the fly based on how you want to place those. And you can place them separately. So one phase you may decide to place this on a building, and then another phase comes up in the round, and you'll place your second spare colonist onto that one. Obviously, every round this would reset during the mayor phase, you would have the option to put new colonists there. During the builder phase, uh, the university, a manned university, you would get an additional colonist directly from the supply uh, placed immediately on that new building that you just built. If you bought a building that doesn't have a circle, uh, you can still take that colonist and just put them in San Juan for later use. The black market will give you up to a three doubloon discount when purchasing a building um, by discarding your choice of up to one VP, one colonist, or one good. So you may decide that you want an additional discount and you throw away a good to get a minus one. If you discard a good, a colonist, and a VP, you can get up to a three doubloon discount on the building purchased. Keep in mind you have to spend your doubloons first when purchasing the buildings. So this is meant as a way, if you're out of money, to be able to get a discount. You can't discard stuff if you have remaining doubloons. You've got to spend your doubloons first and then you can use this to get additional discounts on top of that. Um, also, you can't return colonists on the black market or on quarries that you're actually using to get additional discounts. So if a colonist is here on, on a quarry that you're trying to utilize, those can't be the ones that you discard to get an additional discount. The church will give you VPs during the building phase. So if you purchase from the second 
or third column, the second or the third column on the building board, you would get uh, one VP. If you purchase a large building from the fourth column, you would get two VPs. During the craftsman phase, uh, the factory, if it's manned, will give you extra doubloons based on the number of different goods produced. So if you produce uh, three different goods, you would get two different doubloons. And if you produce five different goods, you would get five doubloons. So again, uh, based on whether you produce one, two, three, four, or five different types of goods, you would get zero, one, two, three, or five different doubloons. Keep in mind, if a good wasn't available in the supply, that wasn't considered produced. So you would not get a bonus as a different good. A specialty factory gives you a doubloon bonus for specializing in a specific type of good. So for one good that you produce, you would get doubloons equal to the number of barrels produced less one. So if I produced five indigo, I would get four doubloons if I have a man specialty factory. And it's only for one type of good you get that bonus. Also, corn does not count uh, for the specialty factory, so you can't use corn. Also, uh, don't take your doubloons until the end of the phase. That way, any additional bonuses you get from production, you can apply towards the total number of barrels produced for your special specialty factory bonus. The aqueduct allows you to produce an extra indigo or sugar if you're using, if you're producing indigo and sugar and using a large indigo or sugary sugar production building. You don't get the bonus uh, if using small buildings. But if you were producing on a large indigo plant and a large sugar plant, you would get one ad additional indigo and sugar. Um, if you were only producing on one large indigo plant, you would get one extra indigo. For the trader phase, the small market, uh, if you sell a good, you get an additional doubloon. So this is an example where you could sell corn to the trading house and get one doubloon if you had a small market. A large market gives you two doubloons for your sale, and these will stack. So if you had a small market and a large market, you could get three extra doubloons on top of the sale price. The office let you sell like goods. So normally in this situation, I couldn't sell indigo because it's already at the market. But if I had a manned office, I could sell an additional indigo at the trading house. Keep in mind for the office, a spot still needs to be available. So if I want to sell sugar here, even though sugar's here, I can because there isn't a spot there. The trading post acts like your own personal trading house. So on your turn, instead of selling instead of selling to the trading house, you can sell to your own trading post. The trading post is nice because you can sell to your trading post even if this is full or it occupies the same good as the trading house. So if this was a situation and I had a man trading house, I could sell an indigo to my trading house for the normal price of one. Keep in mind, trading post, uh, any market bonuses don't apply. The small market extra doubloons only give you extra doubloons if you're selling to the main trading house. All right, buildings that help the captain phase. Uh, the first one is the union hall. So on your turn, before any shipping takes place, you get one VP uh, for every pair of the same goods that you have on your windrows ready to ship. So if you had four indigo, you'd get two victory points, and then you would proceed as normal. The wharf acts as your own ship. So during a load cycle, you can choose to load um, onto your wharf as, as if it was an unlimited cargo ship. Normal rules apply. Normally you would, you would reserve using this until you took advantage of any available cargo spots there, but then you would have to load, per normal rules, if I've got 
seven corn, I've got to load all the goods of one type that I can. So I'd have to load all my goods onto the wharf, but I'm choosing one type of good, and it's during one load cycle. So I may load to one cargo ship, comes around again, load to another cargo ship, and it comes around again, and then I decide I'm going to load this, all my barrels of one good onto the wharf, score victory points as normal. A small wharf is also acts as your own ship, so once uh, during a load cycle you can decide to load onto a small wharf. The nice thing about a small wharf is you can load any different combination of goods. It doesn't have to be the same good. So I could load two corn and two indigo, but I'm only scoring half VPs. So for every two goods, I'm getting one victory point, but they can be any combination of goods. And keep in mind, I can only use this once. So once I make my decision, I'm deciding how many to load, and then this cargo ship has been used during that phase. All the goods get returned to the supply in both the wharf and the small wharf, so the next captain phase, I can use them again. The harbor gives you one victory point per shipment. So it's not the number of barrels, but it's each delivery to a cargo ship. So maybe on the first cycle, I deliver four corn to a cargo ship. I'd get an additional victory point. Then on the next one, I'm able to deliver one indigo to a different cargo ship. I'd get another victory point. And then maybe I'm able to use my wharf or my, uh, my wharf and my small wharf. Those would also count as a delivery. So I'd earn a victory point uh, for, that, for that shipment also. The lighthouse works the same way, but you get doubloons instead of victory points. So you get one doubloon for every shipment or delivery uh, during the captain phase. In addition, if you were the one that actually took the captain role, you earn an additional doubloon. And keep in mind that you're going to get that doubloon if you took the captain role, even if you had nothing to ship. So one doubloon for every shipment, and also one doubloon bonus if you were the one that actually took the captain role, if you have an occupied lighthouse. And as with the harbor, any deliveries to your own personal wharf or small wharf would count, and you'd get the doubloon for that entire shipment. The small warehouse, at the end of the captain phase, um, when all goods need to be stored or spoiled, and if you have an occupied small warehouse with a colonist, you can store an additional type of good. So you always get to store one barrel, so you may decide to store a sugar, and then you can store all of another type of good. Maybe it's all your corn or all your tobacco. The large warehouse works the same way, but you can store two different types of goods in addition to the one barrel that everyone's allowed to store at the end of the captain phase. Finally, the storehouse allows you to store three different types of goods or barrels, and they can be any combination. And keep in mind this is in addition to the one barrel that everyone's allowed to store and in addition to if you have a manned small warehouse or a large warehouse on top of that three additional barrels can be stored in the storehouse if it's manned by a colonist. So those are all the building powers for the base game and the first expansion of Puerto Rico. Let's cover the nobles expansion and then we'll be ready to start. So to play with the Nobles expansion, you'll do just a couple things at setup. You'll lay out the Nobles buildings. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven beige buildings and one production building called the Jeweler. You'll lay them out in their column according um, to this layout based on their victory points. One, two, three three and four victory points. So you'll add those new buildings and you'll add the noble to the supply with the colonists. Now you can use all 20 of the red nobles or a variant is you only use four per player. So if this is a two player game I would just be using eight nobles. And the last thing you do is to start the game instead of this is a two player game you would always replace just one of the colonists with a noble, which can be selected during the mayor phase. Now, during all subsequent refills of the colonist ship, you do the same thing. You just replace one of the colonists with a noble. So the only big changes using the nobles expansion is that the 
colonist supply is no longer limited. So you can use all the colonists that are provided with the game. It's no longer a game end trigger. So there's an unlimited number of colonists to supply the ship. As we talked about, uh, the nobles will be limited, but not the colonists. Um, and as we talked about at the beginning of every mayor phase, or when we're refilling the ship, you replace one of the colonists with a noble. And then now during the, noble phase, during the mayor phase, players that select have the option of taking that red noble, which they would normally do, because at the end of the game, each red noble is a victory point. So it's an additional mechanism to get victory points. So besides the mayor phase, the only other change is these buildings now will have two different, most of them will have two different types of powers based on whether they're manned with a normal colonist or whether they're manned with a noble. So let's go over all these. And actually, before we cover these, one reminder is that if you have a noble, a noble can man any building on your player board and act just like a colonist. So they can do that, and at the end of the game, they're worth a victory point. The only differences they will make is if they're manning some of these specific buildings that are just used in the Noble expansion. All right, so the first one is the land office. If it's occupied by a regular colonist, you can actually pay during the trader phase. You can pay one doubloon to take a face down plantation tile. And then you can take your normal trader action as normal. That's if it's manned by a colonist. If it's manned by a red noble, you can actually discard one of your island tiles, not a quarry, but one of your other um, plantation tiles and take a doubloon from the bank. So the land office lets you do some trading with your land. So during the trader phase, a normal colonist lets you pay a doubloon to take a face down tile. If it's manned by a noble, you can discard a plantation tile and get a doubloon from the bank. The chapel helps during the craftsman phase. So if you've got a manned chapel, if it's manned by a regular colonist, you'll just get an extra doubloon during the craftsman phase. If it's manned by a noble, you'll get an extra VP during the craftsman phase. The hunting lodge during the settler phase, if you have this manned by a regular colonist, you can discard one of your plantation tiles. Uh, not a quarry, but any other of your plantation tiles. And forests always count as plantations, so you can discard that. If you have it manned by a noble and you have the most empty island spaces um, on your board, you get two victory points. So it has to be manned by a noble and you have to have the most empty spaces of any other player. Um, a tie wouldn't count and give you the bonus. A zoning office uh, is used during the building phase. During the building phase, if you have it manned by a colonist, uh, you can get a one discount for any building purchased in the first three columns. If you have it manned by a noble, you would get a two discount, but the building has to be purchased um, from the fourth column, so a large building. So zoning option, you can see, it tells you the phase that's used. Hunting Lodge is used in the settler phase. Zoning office is used in the building phase. So regular colonist gives you a one discount for columns one through three. If you have it manned by a noble, you get a two discount, but it has to be in column four. Keep in mind that you only get one or the other discount, uh, one or the other power based on whether it's manned by a regular colonist or a noble. All right, the royal supplier, uh, it doesn't matter if it's manned by a regular colonist or a noble. The power applies to either. Uh, during the captain phase, you're allowed to discard um, one good per noble that you have on your player board and get one victory point for each of the goods you discard. So let's say you've got, let's say this is manned by a regular colonist or a noble, it doesn't matter, and you dis decide to discard a corn and an indigo and a sugar up to the number of nobles, so let's say you'd have to have three nobles to do that, to discard three different types of goods, you would get three victory points. And keep in mind that would happen before your very first load. 
and no additional bonuses for the discards except the VPs. The jeweler also doesn't matter whether it's manned by a regular colonist or a noble. Um, it acts as a large production building, but it's producing money. So during the craftsman phase, um, if you have it manned, you would get one doubloon for every noble you have on your player board. Also, for any large buildings that give bonuses for large production buildings, the jeweler would count. This is considered a large production building and not a beige building. That's why it has a different color. The villa, if it's manned, again, it doesn't matter if it's a colonist or a noble manning it. During the mayor phase, you can take one additional noble from the supply in addition to what you're eligible to take from the colonist ship. Um, in addition, if there isn't any noble remaining in the supply, you can take a colonist from the colonist supply. So the bonus noble is an addition to the first colonist you can take from the ship. If there isn't a noble, you can take from a regular colonist from the supply. Otherwise, you would have to go without. Finally is the Royal Garden. It's a large building that gives you a bonus at the end of the game. If it's manned uh, by a colonist or a noble, doesn't matter, you earn an additional VP for each noble at the end of the game. So in a normal game with the nobles expansion, all players would earn one VP for all the nobles they have. A manned Royal Garden gives an additional VP, so each noble would, would be worth two at the end of the game. So those are the different buildings that have the special powers, and that should be everything you need to set up and play Puerto Rico.